Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Gallo. I'm the librarian at the Syrian Cultural Foundation's Asher Bonipo Library. I'm really happy to participate in today's Nebo Circle Lecture. Before I present our guest speaker for today, I'd like to provide you with some context regarding the purpose behind organizing this lecture series. In ancient Assyria, Nebu, the Lord of Wisdom, was the patron deity of scholars, inspiring a deep reverence for knowledge. A grand library in Nineveh, supported by rulers like Ashurbanipal, elevated the pursuit of knowledge. This intellectual legacy endured, leading to centers of uh, learning like the School of Nisibis, which contributed to the Islamic Golden Age. Despite challenges, including World War I, Assyrians maintained their love of learning, something we carry with us today. The Nebu Circle Lectures by the Assyrian Cultural Foundation bring scholars together to share insights on Assyrian history, literature, language, and culture, preserving the civilization's enduring passion for wisdom. Today, we are happy to have Dr. Yuval Lavavi as our speaker. Dr. Lavavi's topic for today's lecture is Who was Nebuchadnezzar II? Dr. Yuval Lavavi is an Assyriologist specializing in the socioeconomic aspects, material culture, and political history of the ancient Near East, particularly focusing on first millennium Babylonia. He obtained his PhD from the University of Vienna in 2016 and currently serves as a research fellow at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Lavavi's research encompasses philology, archival studies, and Babylonian historiography, in addition to the publication of numerous text editions from both institutional and private archives, his studies deal with the Babylonian temples and their personnel, the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the role of cuneiform records in biblical studies, and the intricate dynamics among various ethnic and social communities within first millennium Babylonia. After the lecture, we invite you to stay updated on the latest news and events of the Assyrian Cultural Foundation by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. These lectures will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. I will provide you with links to all our social media platforms in the chat uh, shortly. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Mr. Robert Decoletta, who has played a vital role in coordinating all of these efforts. Thank you, everyone. Great, right. thank you, Basimta Sarah. Um, we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Lavavi with us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lavavi, and welcome to all of you. And um, I think it's very important to know um, how we're proceeding with these Nabu lectures. Today's Nabu Circle lecture is about Nabu Khadnasar, uh, a very famous king in, in Mesopotamian history, uh, perhaps a very controversial figure, a legendary figure in biblical sources and so on. So Dr. Lavavi is going to clarify for us, I think those of us interested in the continuity of Assyrian history throughout time should pay attention to this period as a very important period uh, after the fall of the Assyrian Empire and then pr prior to the coming of the Persian or Achaemenid Empire. So with that, we're really excited, Dr. Lavavi, to have you with us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Asar, for, for, for the introduction and, of course, for the invitation. Uh, and thank you all of you for, for attending today. Um, first, I will share my screen. Um, this. And do you see my screen? We're good? Yes, perfect. Mm, okay, so excellent. Um, wait. Um, Yes, this is, uh, okay, so um, as we've heard, uh, today we'll be talking about Nebuchadnezzar II, and second simply because about 500 years before, uh, there was another Nebuchadnezzar, and actually there were three and four, uh, some 70 or 80 years later, uh, but this is the Nebuchadnezzar, the great Nebuchadnezzar um, that we know from the Bible and, and uh, as, as was mentioned from, from many, many traditions. Um, so what I want to do today is first to give a short and rough historical survey so we know when and where we are 
uh, I will briefly talk about the sources that uh, that we have at our disposal, um, and then about the family, the early years, and we'll go on uh, talking about uh, his reign, the empire, the Babylonian Empire, uh, and finally a few words about his legacy. So let's start with with a short historical survey. Um, Yes. So here we are. This is more or less the map of, of the ancient Near East. We are about 700 uh, BCE. Everything, of course, is BCE. So we will go backwards. I'm sure you all uh, uh, used to it by now. Um, at, at this point, we're talking about the Neo-Syrian Empire, who who is uh, dominating the ancient Near East. And as I said, this is a very rough sketch of uh, of, uh, of borders. Um, but the Neo-Syrian Empire had uh, started to have many, many issues, internal issues and external issues. Um, and by the mid of this uh, 7th century, uh, they are no longer controlling Egypt. Egypt is their ally, but uh, um, Assyria is not uh, controlling Egypt anymore. Uh, you heard recently from uh, Shana Zaya about the, the uh, civil war or Babylonian rebellion, which is, again, mid-7th uh, century. Um, and as time went on, around 640, 630, we don't know for sure, but then the Assyrians started to redraw, redraw from the west, and the Egyptians slightly tried to take over uh, uh, to control these lands. Um, and again, internal problems, external problems, until finally in 622, uh, another Babylonian revolt started in Uruk in the south, and this is Nebuchadnezzar who eventually was able to take control of the entire uh, 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 core uh, uh, land of Babylonia um, and pushed the Assyrians up to the north, uh, but uh, uh, the Assyrians did not give up. And it took some time, it was obviously more complicated than what we see here, but eventually in 614 joined with the Medes from, uh, from the east, uh, Ashur, the religious, the religious capital, failed. Actually, Ashur was uh, was conquered only by the Medes. Not the Babylonians were too late for this uh, uh, battle. Uh, and two years later, a joint force of the Medes and the Babylonians were able to to take on uh, to conquer Nineveh. And the Assyrians were basically left in the small with a small garrison only in the city of Haran. And three three years later, this fell as well. And from this point onward, we don't have a, a neo-Syrian entity. And the Babylonian uh, uh, army, now actually led by uh, uh, the young prince Nebuchadnezzar, still his crown prince, not yet king. His father is very, very old. At some point, he remained behind in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar led the Babylonian army. Five years later, they found themselves, as you see here, uh, uh, on the Euphrates, on the shore of the Euphrates. And there was a big battle between the Egyptians who came uh, from the south to the uh, with the Babylonians, and Nebuchadnezzar led the Babylonian army to a great victory, which basically chased the Egyptians back uh, south and opened all the west before the Babylonians. But at this point, more or less, his father Nebuchadnezzar died in Babylon, so he had to go back, uh, uh, get coronated. And only the year after, in 604, he was able to complete this uh, uh, this campaign and took uh, and basically took over the entire the entire ancient Near East. And again, we, then we get this uh, familiar shape of the Neo Babylonian Empire. And this is more or less what the empire that, Nebu uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had until the end of his life in 562. And again, more or less, this is generally speaking the the, the Neo Babylonian Empire, which was also taken finally by. Uh, uh, the Persian in three in five thirty nine. Now there was other uh, 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 events. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar, famously the last no Babylonian king, was very active in the Arabian desert, and before him, Nebuchadnezzar was active in Anatolia. But basically, this is the the uh, the empire of Nebuchadnezzar. This is uh, Babylonia um, under Nebuchadnezzar, and this is so. This is more or less uh, the territory that we are dealing with, and this again more or less the years from 605 to 562. When we're talking about the sources, uh, we'll start from um, the Babylonian Chronicle, which is basically, um, these, these are the, this is a source that uh, uh, I use basically to, to, to have this short survey, the historical survey. These are a group of four or five texts um, which give the very straightforward accounts of, uh, of political history. 
Importantly, these are not royal sources. Uh, so we do hear, for example, on failures and defeats of the Babylonian army and the kings. Uh, I mean, it's a, and generally speaking, this is a very reliable source when it comes to political history. Unfortunately, we don't have it for the entire period, but uh, uh, we have it for, 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 for most, at least half uh, uh, of the period, we have a, a good coverage of the chronicles. There are, of course, royal inscriptions. Uh, here we see in the, in the right, actually, the, the, the upper one is uh, of Nabonidus, so not Nebuchadnezzar, in Jordan, in Sela. Uh, below it, we see a nice image of uh, uh, Nahel Kalb in Lebanon, where we not only have an inscription of uh, a rock inscription of Nebuchadnezzar, but uh, also Egyptian kings and Romans. So this is a very interesting place where many, many kings and rulers uh, uh, decided to, to put uh, um, their inscriptions, their propaganda, basically. Importantly, the, even, uh, even the royal inscriptions uh, of the Neo-Babylonian kings were very much unlike what we you might know from the Neo-Syrian kings. They didn't, the Babylonian kings didn't really write about military campaigns and political history. They mainly wrote about temples and building temples and building walls and all so, so kind of uh, all these uh, uh, public projects and how much uh, uh, they increased the call to certain gods. So this is what was uh, uh, mainly in their minds. So this is what we have in the, uh, the inscriptions. Uh, in the middle, we see two uh, 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 building inscriptions, which were objects. This is a small object that were uh, uh, buried in the foundations of, again, of buildings like temples, palaces, or city walls. And uh, naturally, this, these two were uh, uh, dealt mostly with the said building that they, 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 they commemorate. Uh, so again, no political history in this regard, or very few uh, uh, um, references. Um, at the far left, we have a very unique object, actually, uh, and a rare object. It's not really clear here, but hopefully this drawing will make it slightly clearer. The image on the right is actually Nebuchadnezzar, and he's standing in front of the ziggurat of Babylon, which is basically the Tower of Babel. And above it, we can see the blueprint of another, uh, of another temple. But this is, again, this is a very unique uh, uh, royal inscription, but an actual image of Nebuchadnezzar. So... Um, the main thing that we have is archival texts. These are day-to-day -day documents, like administrative, administrative records, uh, legal documents, and letters, uh, uh, as the one you see here in, in my hands. Um, this is actually this letter is an actual letter written by Nebuchadnezzar, still as crown prince, so he's not king yet. Uh, and to the best of our understanding, this is actually. He, he actually wrote this letter, so it's not his scribe. He actually uh, held this letter and, and, and wrote it, which is something very nice, a very direct contact that you can have with uh, uh, the king himself or then uh, crown prince. Um, but mainly these administrative and legal texts, of which we have tens of thousands, uh, they have dates and names of officials and cities, uh, and we can learn a lot about the day-to-day uh, uh, life uh, in various cities, in various parts of the empire. So this is a very important source that we have. We obviously have non cuneiform sources, which is basically biblical sources and classical sources. Classical sources I will not address today. Um, these are obviously later, so later tradition. Very imp uh, important, but uh, uh, um, the, this is another aspect of, of the, 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 the image of the figure of Nebuchadnezzar. Biblical texts are actually very, very important because some of the biblical texts, like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the end of Second Kings, are actually contemporary to the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Some of them were written during his lifetime. Um, the, the depicting events uh, and the interaction between the kingdom of Judah and Babylon in more or less real time. Um, and importantly, this is a very rare example. We usually say that you know uh, history is written by the by the victors. This is a very rare example of the opposite perspective. These are the people who were conquered by the Babylonians by Nebuchadnezzar, who were exiled by Nebuchadnezzar, and we do have again. Uh, at least parts of, of, of the biblical narratives were written in his lifetime. So this is a very interesting and unique example of uh, the opposite perspective that we have. Let's talk about uh, uh, the family and his early years. So Nebuchadnezzar, of course, this is uh, the English version of the name, the 
Babylonian uh, uh, original form was Nabukudu Utsu or Nabukuduri Utsu. Uh, he reigned from 605, as I said, to 562. He was the son of Nabu Palasar, Nabu Apli Utsu. Um, we know that he had, uh, we know the names of two of his brothers, and we know he had several sisters. We know some of their names. But he was the 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 the, the older the, the the oldest son, and as we and as we will see, he was from very early on uh, 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 groomed to 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 um, to replace uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar himself had uh, uh, we know the names of six of his sons and three of his daughters. One of his sons who eventually replaced him was Evil Merudach. Uh, Amil Marduk is a, a, a Babylonian uh, name, original Babylonian name, or Awil Marduk. Evil Merodak is actually um, the form that we do find in Second Kings. In the very end of Second Kings, he is mentioned, and this is uh, the way uh, that uh, that he is mentioned, Evil Merodak. And Evil Merodak um, was not was not uh, um, replaced by his son so it was not uh, he he was not able to leave the, the throne to, to to his son he was actually replaced by Neriglisa or Nergal Shahutsu who was his brother-in-law because Neriglisa was married to one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters Kashaya but still this is a coup this was a coup later sources classical sources tell us that uh, Abil Merodach was murdered it makes sense that we don't have a confirmation of that in in in, uh, in Cuneiform sources uh, but this was definitely a coup. So this is uh, uh, more or less the end of what we would, we would talk about, the, the family of, of, of Nebuchadnezzar. It's not uh, the final Babylonian king. We'll see that there was uh, um, two or three or two and a half after that. Um, but this is basically the, the, the family, the dynasty, a dynasty that is famously known as the Chaldeans. This is one of the uh, uh, better known names uh, of the family, of the dynasty, of the period. So you can, you can, uh, we can read of the Chaldean period and Chal Chaldean empire. Um, and interestingly enough, the, um, so sorry, who, uh, uh, before that, who were the Chaldeans actually? We know, uh, uh, obviously today we have, uh, uh, um, uh, communities, Chaldean communities, but the Chaldeans that uh, that referred to Nebuchadnezzar um, and um, and Nebuchadnezzar, so the family, they were uh, semi-nomadic tribes that, in the end of the uh, the end of the second millennium, entered from the northwest into Mesopotamia and settled in various places. One of the most important places that they settled is the very south uh, part of Mesopotamia of Babylonia. It was known as the Sea Land, basically the Gulf, which was a bit higher back then, but basically it's 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 a Gulf. Um, and in fact, in the Neo Assyrian period, this area came to be known as Bit Yakin, named after the Chaldean tribes. The different tribes were called Bit Yidakuri, Bit Yakin, and so on. Um, and this was an important uh, 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 Chaldean uh, center or area. Let's call let's uh, let's call it area. But interestingly enough, neither Nebuchadnezzar nor Nebuchadnezzar, they never call themselves Chaldeans. They never present themselves as Chaldeans, nor for that matter, anyone else in contemporary cuneiform sources ever refer to them as Chaldeans. Um, and in fact, the reason we call them Chaldeans is because they are called so they are uh, um, the Bible. In several places, we find a reference to the kings and eventually to all of Babylonia and the Babylonians as Chaldeans. And as I said, since uh, some of these sources are contemporary, uh, there is very good uh, reason to think to, to accept this, this tradition, although it is not something we find in contemporary cuneiform sources. What we do find in, in, in later cuneiform sources, so about in the, in the Seleucid period, so 200, 300 years later, uh, there is a text that referred to Nebuchadnezzar as king of the Sealand. And again, we have this, uh, 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 if we understand that the Sealand was traditionally at that point in the mid uh, first millennium was identified with Bit Yakin, with the Chaldean tribes. So this is probably a, 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 a similar traditions to some extent. And this is also, by the way, why in the Bible Ur is called Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur is actually the, the, the lowest point in the map, just above the, the blue circle. Uh, and so this is, again, this is Ur in the Chaldeans, 
uh, in the Chaldean uh, area, in the Chaldean region. Um, but as I said, they never refer to themselves as Chaldean. In fact, uh, in the one uh, text in which Nebuchadnezzar do address his origin, he called himself son of nobody, uh, Marla Mama, which is a very surprising way to address to yourself. It is, uh, we, we do know this expression for neo-Assyrian kings who use it as derogatory term to their enemies, right? He's a son of nobody, he's, uh, he doesn't deserve to be a king, his, uh, his family is not dignified and so on. So this, this was a derogatory term used by the Assyrians towards their enemy. But Nebuchadnezzar uses this on himself. And it's probably not a coincidence because um, the family of uh, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar uh, came, they were not from the sealand, not from Bityakin, but not too far. As I said, some of the uh, Chaldeans uh, settled in other places, and this specific family um, was settled in Uruk. We saw earlier that the rebellion started in Uruk. And Nebuchadnezzar, as well as some of his forefathers, were actually the governors of Uruk under the, the Assyrian rule. And this is another, uh, and this is also important because he's using, it's not a coincidence that he's using a, a, an Assyrian term to, to, to use against the Assyrians who, uh, whom he eventually uh, uh, was able to, to, from his perspective, freed Babylonia from. Um, and so this was his base. This was the base of the family. Um, and in fact, when Nebuchadnezzar went out to fight the Assyrians in 626, Nebuchadnezzar was very young. We don't know exactly how old was he, we don't know exactly the year of his birth, but he was either around 10, possibly early teens, but uh, he was a very young boy. Later, he will join his, uh, his father with the army, but at the beginning, he was left in Uruk, and in fact, he was given the, I don't know, ceremonial, but he was given the position of a, a head administrator of the temple, of the temple of Ishtar in Uruk. The temple is called Eana. And we have several of his letters, and, and he's appeared, he is mentioned in several uh, um, administrative legal documents and actually some letters that were sent from and to Uruk. And we're going to look at some of these, uh, some of these letters. Uh, the first one is a letter to the king of the land, which is Nebuchadnezzar. And it's very, very important that this, they, they refer to him as king of the land, because as we see in a minute, this is a very, very early, very, very early letter. It was sent by your servants, Amur Dami, Kuduru, and Mardu Shakin Shumi. Kuduru is the very, very young crown prince. And this is a short name, a nickname. Uh, many people who, were, who had this Kuduru Utsur in their name uh, were sometimes referred to as Kuduru. And it starts uh, uh, their, uh, their letter by saying, daily at the opening of the gate, the closing of the gate, we are praying to the Lady of Uru, this is Ishtar, and Danaya for the prosperity, long life, happiness, health, the enduring of the royal throne, and the suppressing of the enemies of the king of the lands. Now, this is, uh, even when uh, addressing the king, this is not the usual language. It's very flourishing. It's very, uh, 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 um, there's a lot of uh, greeting and, 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 and pomposity. And I guess, um, even again, even uh, given that this is a letter to the king, and they go on, all is well with the service of Peana, the temple of your gods, because again, the family came from Uruk, so the, 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 the temple of Peana, of Ishar, is a temple of your gods. And what they're saying basically is we have begun the sheep sharing, uh, sorry, yeah, temple of your gods. We have begun the sheep sharing of the in the temple of your gods. And this is basically what they're writing about, which is a very, very minor event. Um, and there's, uh, uh, there's some conflict or, or uh, between the, the content of the letter and the shape and the form of the letters, the amount of greetings. But they continue, we are praying to the Lady of Uruk and Anaya for the King of the Land, our Lord. And then they say, may this be the first of 1,000 sheep shearing during the reign of the King of the Land, our Lord. And this is the important point, because this is the first sheep shearing of his reign. And actually, so we're talking about probably April and May, he was only of 626. He was only coronated in Babylon in November. So this is before he was officially became king of Babylon. They already accept him as king. 
Uh, it was probably written even before they were able to conquer Babylon, because if we noticed, Babylon is not mentioned in this letter. So he's king of the lands, and he is acknowledged as king, but not of Babylon. So this is a very, very, uh, 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 this letter was written in a very unique moment in time. And I said, later, he joined his father uh, uh, um, and the army. And we have several of our letters that he sent back home or back to his former colleagues. This is, for example, a letter of Nabuchodu Usu. This is Nebuchadnezzar. He is not yet king, so he has to use his actual names. And said, the king uh, has left Haran. He's accompanied with a, uh, by a great force of Medes. And this is, I would say, the Medes and the uh, Babylonians were allies. And the fact that it's mentioned in Haran, we can date this letter exactly to 610, um, which is a uh, great line because these letters are not dated. So it's often uh, difficult to, to date these letters uh, with the, um, to, the, to the year or months and, and so on. And then it goes on to say, whoever loved the king and all loves me personally, father or son, shall not, uh, shall not hold someone back, levy all the men. So he's asking for reinforcement for the military, for the army. But the language that he's using, again, it's a, it's a language of loyalty, of personal loyalty. Again, because the family is from Uruk. Um, and we, we can see it in, in, in various ways. Uh, the next letter is a very short letter. This is a whole letter. I just took out some, some of the greetings by in the beginning. So letter of Nabuchodu also by the protection of Ninuta, the war god. I am well, and so is all of the great army that is uh, that is here. Now, by the way, we see that the king is not around. The king was already uh, in, in Babylon, sick uh, and old. You should be happy. Perform your work. Do not neglect the work uh, and write to me what news or, or words you might have. And this is unique because he doesn't say anything. Usually... This is, in fact, this is the only case, only letter that we know that there is no content, there's no demand, there's no request, there's no information being uh, 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 transmitted. It is just hi, again, to his former colleagues. And we also have letters from him as king. So this is the word of the king. Now it's Nebuchadnezzar after his father died. Uh, I am well, may you be happy. This is a regular way that kings address uh, uh, their uh, subordinates in letters. Do not neglect the, uh, the service of Peana, temple of my god. So earlier it was the temple of his father god. Now it's his uh, his own god. Um, pray for me for the lady of Uruk and Anaya. And just to show you that this is not the regular way to address different temples and gods, we have another letter. This is slightly earlier. So here is still Nabuchodonosor. He's not king. But this was sent to Babylon, to the temple of Nabu in Babylon. And here he said, do not neglect the service of the temple, look up the service of the temple. And so the very day you see this letter, do not array, wait, and so on. So he's asking for some military garments and equipment, but here it's just a temple. It's not, um, it's not the, 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 the temple of his gods. Um, yeah, so we saw where he came from, from Uruk, and we saw that he was groomed to take his father's throne, which he eventually and quite successfully did. He became actually the face, I think, of the Neo-Babylonian uh, Empire, the Babylonian period uh, of Babylonia at its peak. But I think there's something a bit misleading about this general image of Neo the Neo-Babylonian Empire and its association with Nebuchadnezzar, because while Nebuchadnezzar was indeed a great king who immensely influenced the course of history, the Neo-Babylonian Empire itself, and I mean politically, not culturally, but politically, as far as empire goes, empires go, um, was not such a success story as it might be remembered. Um, and of course, I will now try to show it to you, but of course we have the advantage of the bird eye view. So we can first uh, uh, say, mention, that um, the Neo-Babylonian period lasted 85 years if we start counting from 626 when Nebuchadnezzar came to power, if we start counting from the moment there is no more uh, neo Assyrian Empire, which it's, it's another way, uh, it's a valid way if you think of the empire, it's just 70 years. This is the shortest of all ancient Near Eastern empires. Um, and again, 43 years of this was Nebuchadnezzar. So it's not only that. Um, as I said, Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar himself ruled for 43 years. His son ruled for two years, but then replaced in a coup by his brother-in-law. 
Meriglisa. Now, the son of Meriglisa, Labashi Marduk, this is why I said earlier two, two and a half kings, because he only ruled for two or three months and also was also replaced in a coup by Nebuchadnezzar, the, the less uh, uh, neo Babylonian kings. So we have 43 years of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, but then we have four kings and two usurpers in 23 years, 17 of which is one king, it's Nabonidus, and there is nothing stable about the period of Nabonidus. He was uh, an exceptional king, an odd king, um, so there was nothing stable uh, in his reign, although it was the longest uh, uh, of the four. Why is that? Why, how can we reconcile this 43-year block of stability and greatness, which is Nebuchadnezzar, with the overall basically flimsiness of the Neo-Babylonian political entity or imperialism? Well, I think first of all, the obvious must be said, Nebuchadnezzar was a great king and a great ruler. Um, and this was obviously a part of it. Once he died, things fell apart quite fast. Uh, and this is not something we don't know. We can think uh, maybe perhaps of uh, Alexander, who uh, uh, founded the huge empire, which immediately collapsed more or less after he died. Uh, but Alexander died very young, and he didn't have the time to, to actually uh, establish a well-founded empire. This is not the case with Nebuchadnezzar. And I think um, one of the crucial points regarding the Babylonian imperialism is that it wasn't really part of the plan to begin with. So yes, Nebuchadnezzar sorry, uh, was able to take Babylon and its historical core, as we saw, quite fast in the beginning, uh, in 626. But the Assyrians did not give up. And there was a lot of back and forth for quite a while. We didn't go into this resolution, but three years after the uh, Babylonian revolt, the Assyrian actually took Uruk back for three years, and the Babylonians were uh, 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 was sta stayed in kind of an island among the Assyrian forces. It was only 12 years later, in 614, the city of Ashur was taken, and two years later, Nineveh. So it was quite a while. And importantly, the conquest of these cities was done with the help of the Medes from the east. In fact, as I mentioned, technically speaking, Ashu was conquered only by the Medes. Nebuchadnezzar and his army was not there in time. This is, by the way, what we find in the Chronicles. In the Babylonian Chronicles, it's another uh, way that we see that this is not a royal source. He just didn't make it on time. Now, beyond Babylonian proper, the dynamics took a predominantly reactionary nature, not in the sense that Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar were pacifist, steering clear of conflict, uh, but rather and this is obviously purely speculative, they may have been inclined to focus their efforts uh, on securing Babylonia itself. I am skeptical, this is my view, of course, whether they would have actively pursued the complete er 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 eradication of the Assyrian entity off the map, like eventually had happened. Uh, and this tendency is observable even after the final fall, fall of Assyria in Haran. They now, as we said, so they now face the Egyptians in Kakami, so they still have to react and fight the Egyptians. And this lack of imperial ethos, uh, we can see it not only in this kind of ad hoc way uh, that the empire itself was formed, but um, we also see it in the royal inscriptions, in the Babylonian royal inscriptions, uh, and more importantly, the Babylonian or Nebuchadnezzar imperial policy, which at least in the big, initially, it's the lack thereof. So regarding royal inscriptions, I mentioned before the Babylonian kings, unlike the Assyrian, their Assyrian predecessors did not write much about military campaigns um, and imperial power. They mainly focused on buildings, Babylonian cities, and especially the temples. Since they are not talking about it, there's nothing really much to see or to read. Uh, this inscription could be, to some extent, uh, sometimes even boring. They are very long, and the, not much is happening, especially, again, when you compare it to the Assyrian uh, uh, inscriptions. Uh, we, we can take one inscription, for, for example. This is the Brisa inscription uh, from the uh, one of the rocks, uh, the rock reliefs in, in, uh, in Lebanon. It is quite long, so we're not going to read the whole thing, but we can look at the structure of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the inscription. Uh, these headings and subheadings is uh, 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 given in the latest edition of the text uh, by Rocio de Riva. And we can see he's talking about the temples in Babylon and the offerings to Marduk and similar things he's, he's, uh, he's mentioning uh, regarding Bosipa and the god Nabu that was mentioned. 
And so he places rock inscriptions at the edge of the empire, but he doesn't speak of the of this empire. This is, of course, not insignificant. It might be less exciting than the Assyrian grunt narrative, but this is what Nebuchadnezzar and actually the other Babylonian kings um, wanted to project. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that he didn't care much his empire, but this, I think, was not the goal to begin with. We can also see it in the foreign policy and the way the empire was run, and we can see here all this additional projects, the East Wall and, and, and Nergal and, and, and other temples, uh, uh, many, 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 many projects. And all these projects that he built required funds and lots of funds. Um, because the Babylon that we all have in mind, this is actually Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the city that he the, that he built and is stuck in, in, in public memory. This is, of course, the city of the Ishtar Gate, um, which you can see actually live in, in Germany, although I think the museum will be closed for the next 10 or 15 years of this, this part of the museum. Um, this 3D model, by the way, is from a book by Ulf Pedersen and so, uh, so, uh, so on the, the, the other uh, models we will see. So this is a famous Ishtar Gate. We, of course, uh, we can talk about the, the ziggurat or the Tower of Babylon, however we want to imagine it. Um, and this was, generally speaking, a huge city with huge temple and palaces and gardens. What we see here uh, uh, under the red arrow is the North Palace. Behind it is the South Palace of Nebuchadnezzar, of course. Behind it, we see the, uh, uh, the ziggurat. And if we look at this, the same uh, area from a different angle, so we have in the left the North Palace again, the South Palace behind it. And in the background, we see the Ishtar Gate. We saw it. We just saw it. Think of the scale of this uh, of this uh, of this complex. This is huge. And just so, just to get a, an idea of how huge this is, this, this is actually, uh, we can lay out. This is the the ground plan from the German excavation. Now it's two D on three D, obviously, so it's not very clear. But we can turn it to get a better idea, a better look. Uh, with all the, the the five huge courts courtyards with the main courtyard in, the, in uh, uh, at the at the center, and again just to see to understand how big and impressive this building was, this is the uh, the Western Wall in Jerusalem today. You can see the number of people. If we put it to scale, this is how it scaled compared to the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, palace. Uh, and since we are, or some of us uh, are in Chicago, you can also have a look at Ridley Field, and this would also actually fit nicely within the Palace of Nebuchadnezzar. And they also have lions. Uh, in this case, actually, the Chicago lion is slightly larger or higher, taller than the Babylonian lion, but the Babylonian lion is trampling someone. So there's, uh, there's that. So everything went in to, to, to Babylon, Babylonia, in order to pay for all of this. But no investment was made uh, went out to the newly acquired territories. We don't really see Nebuchadnezzar, at least in the early years, managing the empire. And it's not only the money, not only the funds for different projects, it is also the way he dealt with problems. As when you have such a huge empire and so many territories, you have many, many problems, of course. Um, and for we can uh, mention, for example, that in 604, when he, after he was coronated, his father died, he had to go back to Babylon, coronated. Uh, in 604, he was uh, finally, he finally made it to, 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 to the West, to, to Syria. And the main event in this campaign was the conquer of Ashkelon, which he destroyed. But then what actually happened to these territories? I mean, we know from uh, some sources in the palace that uh, the sons of the king of Ashkelon were taken back and lived in Babylon. Their father uh, uh, died during the event. Uh, but what happened in the in the West, in Syria, in uh, in Palestine, in Judah, and all these places? Um, we can look to an inscription that commemorating the building of the new palace. This is actually an inscription commemorating the palace that we just saw. This huge palace, the South Palace, um, and there he lists the different officials and group who contributed to the project. There we can see that uh, many of what was previously Assyrian provinces like Tyre, Gaza, Ashdod, and so on, now had their own local kings. There were small kingdoms again, no Babylonian officials, no Babylonian governors. There was no booth on the ground as far as the Babylonians. 
And actually another good illustration for this lack of consistency in the foreign policy, we can see in his treatment of Judah and Jerusalem in the 597 campaign. So this is not the main destruction of Jerusalem and the exile, but this is 11 years before. And we have two main sources from this, for this episode. One is 2 King 24, um, as the, uh, and the other is a Babylonian chronicle called the ABC 5. Um, and this is what the Babylonian chronicle says about this event. And remember, this is not a royal perspective. It's pretty straightforward. The seventh year, this is 597, as I said, in the month of Kislimu, the king of Akkad, this is Nebuchadnezzar, mustered his troops and marched to Hatti. Hatti is Syria, basically the west. And he set up his king against the, against the city of Yahud, which is, of course, Jerusalem. In the month of Fatahu, the second day, he took the city and captured the king. He installed there a king of his choice. He took them its massive tribute and brought it to Babylon. So again, this is what he did. He conquered the city, re uh, replaced the king, and mainly the most important thing is taking tributes into Babylon. Now, as I said, there is a, a biblical version of this story, and it actually gives us a much longer account with many more details. We learn, for example, from the biblical uh, narrative that the captured king was Jehoiachim, but we also learned that he won the, wasn't the actual, actually the one who rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. That was his father, Jehoiachim, uh, which the names are very uh, uh, similar, unfortunately. But Jehoiachim, the father, uh, happened to die just as Nebuchadnezzar was approaching uh, 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 Jerusalem. So his son was left to face the consequences of his bad decision, bad decision to go with Egypt. Um, the king that uh, Nebuchadnezzar decided to put on the throne instead was actually the uncle, Zedekiah. He was, he was actually named Metaniah, and Nebuchadnezzar, according to Second Kings, changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, unlike what he did in Ashkelon, just a few years earlier, he decided to leave the city safe and just take the king with him to Babylon, along with his family, entourage, and some extra elite. But in Jerusalem, he simply takes the king's uncle, so still within the family, and puts him in charge hoping that he will feel loyal to Nebuchadnezzar because he was the one that put him on the, that uh, 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 put him on his throne. And actually, he also have his nephew, Jehoiachin, in, in the palace in Babylon. Um, so, but this plan worked for about 10 years because to be exact, 11 years later, Zedekiah rebelled too, and Nebuchadnezzar arrives again with uh, the army to Jerusalem, but this time he destroys the city, he burns the temple, exiles many, many more, and this is basically the end of the Judean kingdom, and the, obviously the, the, the beginning of the, the Babylonian exile. Um, now, this part of the Babylonian problem did not survive, or perhaps not yet discovered, um, and so what exactly that was the arrangement in Judah after the, the destruction of Jerusalem is not entirely clear and very much debated among scholars, but we're, of course, interested in Nebuchadnezzar, not specifically Jerusalem, and those years, so not specifically the year that Jerusalem was destroyed, but those years, uh, the general time frame was actually key in, in his reign, in the reign of, of Nebuchadnezzar. It was more or less then, which is the mid-reign of, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, that he seemed to, re to have realized that there was this was not really maintainable. This was not sta sta uh, stable. It wasn't working. So he started to do to he started a much more proactive policy, sending personnel, Babylonian personnel, to the western parts of the empire. For example, he sent people to Tyre to oversee this key trade hub. He gives lands in Syria to various Babylonian temples for them to cultivate, thus making profit, and again having them physically be in those lands. So as uh, Babylonian officials being in the uh, outside of Babylonia. And he also mentioned that his rock inscriptions, all of them, at least what we know uh, and what was found, was all in Lebanon. Now, um, this is uncertain, but this may very well have been considered the end of the Babylonian Empire, at least in the sense that beyond that, so Judea, Judah and the Sinai, was kind of a buffer zone between Nebuchadnezzar direct domination and Egypt. But as I said, this is unclear. The, uh, just, we know the fact that all of the inscriptions are in, in Lebanon, and we don't really have sources about what happened in, in, Ju in Judah after the destruction. But beyond that, also in Babylonia itself, within Babylonia itself, um, 
we see that um, he's placing more and more of his own men, so royal officials, to oversee the different temples, which were, of course, hugely important economically, but also politically. So he's tightening the grip uh, to get back control of the state. The thing is, it was apparently not enough, or perhaps too late, because, again, once he died, his son-in-law, uh, Nereglisar, dethroned Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, son, to Amir Marduk, and stability was never really gained. Now, the story of the end of the Nova Babylonian Empire is very complicated, and the last Nova Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who's again all, also a usurper, had, and he had very different ideas regarding the empire. Because when, uh, and so we see when Cyrus the Persian finally brought the Persian army to the gates of Babylon, there were barely any resistance. But again, this is another story, and we want to go back into Nebuchadnezzar's time. And if you look at the second half of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, we have much, much less sources regarding uh, this period. Uh, we are mainly familiar with his attempts to consolidate to consolidate uh, the royal domination over, of, over Babylonia itself, as I mentioned. Uh, we do know that there was some an another adventure in Egypt in 567, uh, but the details are not entirely clear. And importantly, um Babylonia Babylonia never controlled Egypt at any at any point. So whatever happened there was not uh, was not successful. In the end, when we think of Nebuchadnezzar and his legacy, there are I think two main things that stand out. Um, one is uh, on the one hand the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and the temple, the Judean temple in 586, uh, the Babylonian exile uh, that followed uh, 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 <clears throat> It cemented him in Judean, Jewish, and later, of course, Christian memory as a key figure. And in fact, without him, if this would not have happened, who knows what would have happened to the Judean kingdom uh, and whether they would not just slowly dissolve into history like many other people around them. So actually, Nebuchadnezzar, in uh, exiling the, 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 uh, the Judean community and allowing them to stay as a community in Babylon, was very important from a Judean or Jewish uh, historical perspective. But on the other hand, it's not only Jerusalem. He did create a massive empire, and most importantly, probably, he built an unmatched and unforgettable world center. In Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, the Babylonian scholars made huge leaps in astronomy, predicting astral phenomena in literature, in historiography, and architecture, of course. So when some two or three hundred years later, when Alexander the Great arrived there, he made it into his capital. Then not by it's not a coincidence. The legends of the Tower of Babylon and the Hanging Gardens mesmerize the world uh, for centuries to come. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. This is all Nebuchadnezzar. All the, the greatness of Babylon is actually Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in many ways, we saw that he came from a well-respected family who was who was actually working for, for the Assyrians. And his father, who rebelled against the same Assyrians, groomed him from a very young age to replace him. Uh, and apparently he did um, not a bad job because I think few other people who shaped history in such a way and in such a moment as Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and this is partly evidenced by, I think, the very the very fact that we're talking about him today. Uh, and this is what I have to say. So thank you very much for your attention.